So, as you know, Armored Core 6 is about to release, and as someone who is a massive fan of From Software, I decided to prepare myself by playing some of the older Armored Core games. But what I honestly wasn't expecting was how complicated the games can be. Not so much in the stages themselves, more so in the customization and the building of your Armored Core. The systems of it go far deeper than I ever thought they would, and honestly, I'm a little bit afraid people are going to pick up Armored Core 6, not really realize how to create their Armored Core properly and then give up. So that's why I'm here. I'm going to explain what you'll need to be looking at of each part of your Armored Core, and kind of try and shove you in the right direction of the gameplay style that you want so you th at the very least understand the basics when you finally jump in yourself. Okay, I'm gonna be honest for a second. I'm just making this video for my friends so I can kind of help them so they can build their mechs properly and have fun in the actual game. And you know, so I get a chance to blow, m blow them away in multiplayer. Especially for those who aren't good at listening to advice. Math. I'm also somewhat of a newbie to this series. I haven't played each game yet, and I only really started playing them after Elden Ring came out because of the Armored Core 6 rumors at the time. There are hundreds and thousands of people who know the nitty gritty details of this series and all these mechanics way better than I ever could. So if you want some extra details or information or anything like that, I would recommend going to things like the Armored Core Discord server. They're very helpful, they're generally very very nice, and they have a lot of experience. So if there's anything, any extra information that this video doesn't provide to you that you need, be sure to check stuff like that out. Also, I'm going to be using Last Raven primarily as my vi visual example and demonstrations as it's the game I have the most experience with. And personally, it's my favorite out of the series, since I already got like 10 playthroughs in it. So yeah, I'm going to be using that game primarily. Now, without further ado, let's get on to the most important part of your AC, the legs. Now, why are the legs the most important? Well, which legs you're going to get is going to somewhat dictate what your build is going to look like and how you are going to be building the rest of your AC. Let's get the big thing out of the way first. There are multiple types of legs to select with each their own quirks and advantages and stats and other things. So let's just go through them one by one. First things first, the bipedal legs. One could argue they are the best all around, good stats all across the board, and the different types of basic bipedal legs which give you a lot, a lot of options. It does have one disadvantage, and that is with certain weapon types that we're gonna get to further explain when we do get to the leg parts that do function well with those weapons. Next up are reverse joint legs. For the most part very similar, however, it has far better jumping power and overall very low energy drain. Which is a good thing, trust me, we'll get to that later. And get used to me saying that. Along with that, it also has pretty great uh, load bearing weight. But it does sacrifice some of the bipedal legs' defense and armor. Now we're getting onto some more unique stuff with the tank threads. By far, in my experience, the slowest out of all the legs as you're not even able to equip boosters on him, but also the tankiest, and the one with the most firepower potential. Thanks to the threats being as big and heavy as they are, they what they lose in mobility, they more than make up for in pure firepower due to the leg, due to the leg carry weight. Being the highest out of all the leg types, you're able to strap some serious firepower to, the, to this thing. Multiple times over. <laughs> it's also the only type of legs that give you complete free use over your shoulder weapons at all times. Things like small missile launchers any leg type can use without issue, but with some things like chain guns, slug guns, laser blasters, and some other things, if you're using bipedal legs or other certain leg parts coming up, you'll need to waste some time getting your AC in a certain position before it's ready to fire, and wasting like 2 seconds getting ready to fire, then needing to stand completely still to keep shooting, and then needing to waste more seconds just to get out of that position, it's not very fun in a mobile game like Armored Core, and it's also pretty much a death sentence if you're fighting another AC. So 
So, tangling to allow you to have a lot of freedom with your weapon choice thanks to it's not needing to crouch thing to fire and it's amazing and it's amazing like carry weight. And the mobility issues are somewhat negated by how immensely tanky these legs are compared to most other legs. You aren't going to dodge damage with this thing, more so you're going to fire everything you have and pray that you melt the enemy before they shred you. Granted, its energy defense is on the lower end, but that shouldn't be a problem as long as you disintegrate everyone before they even come close. Now onto the other leg part that can fire back weapons without crouching, the quadru- the quadrupedal? The qua- the quadruple- the spider legs. They're somewhat, they're somewhat mobile with moderate defensive stats, however they don't really come close to the defensive stats of, of bipedal legs. And they use up a lot of energy, but the carry weight is better than those legs. While it can also use back weapons without crouching, you can fire them while being airborne, which makes it kind of awkward to use in my experience, as you're giving up the great defensive stat of the tank legs, so you need to be more mobile to avoid damage. But thanks to the high energy the quadruple legs need in the first place, make makes staying airborne somewhat difficult, and you can't even use your strongest firepower while being airborne. You can more than likely find great success with these legs, but I haven't really found any great builds with these legs that I can make myself. And now for the final type of legs? Bottom part? The hover legs. By far the most mobile leg parts in the game, despite that you can't equip boosters with it, However, you will be constantly floating and you have amazing speed, even without your boosters. And in levels with water, the legs will float above it without en without costing any energy, making them possibly the best of the legs for those types of missions. On the horizontal plane, its speed is unmatched. Especially with good control, it's very easy to outspace and outpace any opponent you're up against. However, with no ability to jump and vertical boosting using up a lot of energy very quickly, you're for the most part gonna stick to ground level with these legs, kinda like with the tank legs. These legs are also the weakest in the game, having the lowest health and defense out of almost any leg part. The tank legs might have lower energy defense in some cases, but at some times. So you're really going to be a st like a glass cannon build with these legs. It also needs to crouch to shoot back weapons, which is basically a death sentence with your low defenses. Now with all the leg parts of the way, let's get to something a bit more simple. The core, basically the chest area. The cores are a lot simpler and there aren't as many, but there are still important decisions to be made. That can be said for every single part to be honest. A lot of them are big and tanky with good defense, a good arm weight and a lot of optional part slots. Again, we'll talk about that later. There's cores with good defenses and good arm weight and a lot of optional parts. But those are usually a bit heavy in the way you down and cost a lot more energy and are therefore a lot less mobile. And then there's also cores who are on the opposite side of the spectrum, and even some who tries to balance all those stats out for good measure. Get, again, it depends mostly on what kind of build you want to run, which core you're getting. The most unique thing that the cores have in the later games is specific abilities tied to them. First of all are the missile interceptor guns. These are exactly what the name implies, if a missile comes towards you and your aiming is in its general direction, a small laser will automatically shoot out and destroy it. It costs no energy and no ammo. Some cores are better at this than others, usually the heavy ones are better at, better at doing multiple missiles at the same time, and most cores have them by default but not all of them, so keep an eye out. Secondly, hangar units. Basically a small unit that, can, that you can store a small weapon in, like a handgun. Nothing flashy or special, but it can come in handy in longer missions where ammo becomes a bit of a concern. Third up is Overboost, or OB as the game will call it. One of the two core abilities that require that you activate them manually. A high powered boost system that combines with both your external boosters and your AC, or your AC's legs. It will propel you forward at immense speed, otherwise not really possible. Downside of it of it is though you can only move forward and like slightly move left or right. 
Backwards movement is completely impossible and thanks to basically overclocking your boosters you are draining your energy very quickly and it causes a massive increase in your AC's heat level so you can't spam it at all. Still great for getting from point A to point B or quickly getting in the face of an opponent. Lastly, Exceed Orbit or EO. Cores with Exceed Orbit will contain one or two orbital pods that when activated will hover above your AC at all times. These can also be deactivated at will at any time. The pod or pods will automatically target and fire at any opponent in visible range even if you are not locked onto them. The fire rate, damage, ammo amount, and what time of ammo it shoots depends on the EO and we'll get more into that when we get to weapons specifically. With cores for the most part out of the way, now come arms. These are even more simple, thankfully. There are only two major things you're looking for in arms, or at least in normal arms. It's carry weight and it's aim accuracy, and maybe blade aptitude. All these things are going to need a little bit to talk to about stats, so I'll leave that for later, but just keep it in mind for now. There's also unique arms that are weapons itself, therefore you're not adding any extra weight by equipping arm weapons, but you do limit your variety somewhat and they're a little bit heavier than most arms by default. Now for the head. Mostly you're going to want to look at the radar functions and ECM resistances. ECM goes into stats again, so let's leave that, but the radar is more important than you might think but there's many different functions the head does or does not have and you'll have to look into it to find out. Like the auto map. This isn't the mini map you have in the corner of your screen, but rather it's a map that you can open at any time to see a detailed layout of the level, where you currently are and where you have been. It's very useful for labyrinth like levels or just big missions, missions in general. It never hurts to have. Night vision. What do you think this does, honestly? Well, it doesn't affect your lock on, I think. Not being able to see can make a mission a real nightmare if you lose track of your objective or enemies. Biosensor. This is a sensor that shows biological organisms on the minimap and lets you lock onto them, which, if you don't have this, you can't do. So, if it wasn't obvious enough, this is invaluable on missions where a lot, with a lot of biological enemies. Radar function. Again, it's not too difficult, it's a radar that helps with detecting enemies. Radars also have a limited range they can display and have different intervals of scanning. Check these out in the stats screen so you know what you're dealing with. Last up is the missile sensor. This makes missiles show up on the radar, so if they are behind you and you get a keen eye and reflexes, you can still dodge them. While having all these would be great sometimes, they're all only available on heads with otherwise poor stats, or sometimes it just does not fit with your AC. Try to look into the mission briefing to see what you're going to need and stick with that. If you need some you need to find a certain item or such in a big map or labyrinth, like a lab area type place. Auto map is going to be very useful. Missile sensor is going to be a good thing when you're going to a fight with many enemies all at once, etc, etc. Just look in the mission breathing and check what you need and equip appropriately. And with all that, we're finally done with the first four parts of your AC. Eh, kinda. I've kind of been neglecting the stats that you need to look into, so let's, get, let's go over that real quick. First, some universal stats that almost every part is going to have. First stat is weight, and it's exactly what you think it is. This, this, this determines how heavy your AC is, and the heavier you, heavy you are, the less mobile you are as well. 
energy drain. Basically how much energy this item will cost you to equip. And you need to have sufficient energy to even equip this. And how much you have depends on the generator you equip. And I'll explain energy and what to watch out for with that and all that in the generator section later on. Just like with the lightweight stats, almost every part of your AC is going to have this stat, so keep a close eye on it. Now onto some stats exclusive of the four body parts we just talked about. AP. This stands for armor points, and this is basically your health bar, but it's in numbers. And while this is your health bar, don't worry about increasing it on its own. I'm gonna be honest. On its own, it doesn't really increase your survivability a whole lot in my experience. You could start the game with a basic AP. AC with around 8k AP and at end game still be around 8k AP and have much better survivability just because it's, your survivability is mostly determined by your defensive stats. Speaking of the defensive stats, let's get over the shell and energy defensive stats real quick. This way your survivability is really going to be determinant in the damage taking place. Shell defense reverts to things like bullets, rockins and things like solid rounds. Energy defense obviously referring to your defensive stats against things like laser blades, pulse cans, laser cans, things like that. If you want a tanky build, look mostly at these two stats and getting your biggest number of defenses from cores, legs and arm parts. Now for some part specific parts and the main stats you're going to want to look out for. For the headpiece it's obviously the previously mentioned versus ECM stat. What this will determine is how effective your AC will be against ECM attacks. And what those will do to you if you're not able to resist them is mess with your mini map so it constantly statics. And even when you do get it back, enemies won't show up on it. And even more annoying, it will ruin your lock on for extended periods of times. Basically, making any kind of long range attack with anything that's not a blade damn near pointless. Now, for the core piece, you're going to want to keep your eye on the max arm weight. This, is term this determines how much weight your core will be able to carry with everything that you do with the arms. So the arms and the and the weapons are both counted on this. This means if you want to, if you have a lightweight core, you can't stick big arms with big weapons on it. Okay, well you can, but your targeting performance will severely plummet, which is something you do not want to happen. Speaking of targeting performance, the arm stats are exactly that and more. Main thing here is the aim accuracy. The greater the value, the more precise you will be, which is also obviously important for quick DPS and deathmatch scenarios and just not wasting your ammo. Because that can be scarce and more difficult in longer missions. There's also the blade aptitude stat, which again, greater the value, the better your blade will work with these arms. In what way, I'm not quite certain, I'll be honest, but feel, but feel free to experiment for yourself if you feel like equipping a blade. And now to go with one of the most important parts, one of the most important stats, the leg carry weight. Just like picking what bottom part you want to influence your build, your leg carry weight will determine exactly how much you'll, you can strap onto your AC. And every single part you can strap onto your AC is counted here. So if you want a, want a decked out AC with some powerful parts, better pick some legs with some great carry weight. And again, you can technically go overweight in some of the later games, but don't do it. Just don't do it. It's not recommended. There's also moving ability, where they're a bit more specific about what type of movement, movement this part is good at and not. Things like moving ability, turning ability, braking, landing and jumping performance. Again, pay attention to these based on what you want your build to be. Okay, now we're done with basically the outsider shell of your AC. Let's talk about what you need to know about more of the inside mechanisms. And with that, let's head straight to probably the most important inside part of your AC, the generator. The generator does exactly what you think it does. It powers your AC and what generator you get decides how much energy output you have, which determines what parts and how many parts you can equip. What's very important to note that not only do you need enough energy to power all the parts of your AC, including the weapons and whatnot, how much energy you, energy you have left over in total will determine how big your energy bar is. And that energy bar is important. It's the only thing keeping your boosters functional and much more like firing certain weapons and keeping certain shields up.
Now, next up is the radiator. Yes, you're also gonna need to make sure your AC doesn't overheat, which depends on your build and the game. Looking at you, Nexus. Can be somewhat difficult. Your AC overheating can very easily decide whether you win or lose, especially without good cooling. What happens is that your energy bar will drain far more quickly, and if you're running a glass cannon build that relies on the energy bar to survive, yeah, just don't overheat. Another thing I'm not too sure on actually is damage over time. It might be that only certain weapons like flamethrowers cause this effect, but it's also possible to get your AC overheated so far that you'll take damage from it. Again, not too sure, but, but hey, you shouldn't let yourself overheat anyway, so just avoid it and you won't have to find out. Okay, while technically not an inner part of the AC, this part is too important to put it with the MISC parts, so I'm putting it here. The boosters. I don't think I need to tell you on the surface what the boosters mainly do. What I can tell you is that each booster acts differently. Some of them push your speeds to ridiculous amounts, but drain your energy like stupid and vice versa. Boosters also seem to be a part, of, part that overheat your AC the fastest, not counting outside damage of course. Again, some legs. Uh, legs can't equip boosters. Their boosting ability relies completely on the legs that you get. Okay, inside parts done now. Now for the stats for, you need to look at for these parts. Also, all these also have weight, so don't forget about that. For the generator, you're obviously going to want to look at the energy output. It's what's going to give you your energy consumption, and the higher that value, the more you can stick onto your AC and more of the energy bar you'll have in missions. There's also the condenser cap. This is a small red part on the energy gauge you see in missions, which also immediately ties into the next stat and the emergency cap, I think. Okay, so when you use enough energy to get to this red part of the gauge, what basically happens is you'll notice that um, uh, this red part drains slower than the rest of the gauge, which is good because if you run out completely, you're going to have to wait for the entire energy bar to re recharge again before you can perform any actions that need energy. So no boosting, no energy shields, and no shooting energy weapons. I think it's the emergency cap that determines how much extra energy is in that red part of the gauge. And while you might think, well, I won't let it go down that far, remember that overheating is a thing and that could pro that could drop the bar completely if you've done the any action that requires a decent chunk of energy this far, so don't try to forget that. Sometimes it's out of your control whether you lose energy or not, so be prepared for any and all situations. So to sum up, I think the condenser cap is how much red bar you have and the emergency cap is how much extra energy is in that gauge. Now onto the last of the generator stats, the calorific value. Again, another important one is this one lets you know how much heat is produced by this generator. The higher the value, the hotter it gets, and the C value on some generators can get so damn hot, it even burns the, the coolest of setups. I wasn't planning on dropping my own opinions on certain builds with certain parts, but this might be the exception. I do not recommend running an energy build with a high C value generator. It's, it's, it's not a good time, trust me. Now finally done with the generator, we move on to the radiator with the stats you're already expecting, the cooling. Okay, there ain't much here, the higher the value, the better the cooling, basically. And by the by, you can't have it that you never build heat. That's just not happening. Boosting and the energy and the generator you use build a good chunk of heat on your own, not to mention any enemy damage that might cause heat. So never building any heat is just not something that's going to happen. Now up is the forced cooling. This is how quickly the radiator gets rid of the heat when you're already overheating. This could be important because of how you'll lose AP and energy until you get back to your normal temperatures. So, especially if you're running like an energy build that really requires energy fast, this might be a good stat to look into. Now for a bit of a confusing one, the energy consumption. I'm not too sure on this one again, but what I, what I think happens is when you're overheating like crazy, your radiator actually taps into your generator for emergency consumption, so your energy bar drains as your radiator is trying to cool your AC. So I 
think the higher the value, you're better, the better your AC is at fast cooling without it draining too much energy. Honestly, I've got nothing, no matter how much I experimented, and I haven't really been able to find an answer online either. With that said, we've gone through all the required parts. But there are still some parts that are not required, but could help your gameplay out in the long run, so let's just talk about them. The FCS, or more simplified, your targeting system. Now I know what you're thinking, or what you're going to say, and that's, that sounds somewhat important considering I'm using that to fucking aim. And yes, you're right, however, over my multiple playthroughs now, I have yet to find a need to replace the one I started with. Maybe it would have helped, but I honestly never felt like I had to. Just wanted to get that out there now, so let's actually talk about it. There's multiple things to consider with what your game style is going to be. There are multiple lock types, and some are wide but shallow, limiting, limiting your range greatly. These would be great use for, like, close ranged builds. And on the polar opposite, there's narrow but deep ones making your targeting square very tiny but giving you immense range. There's also FCS's that allow you to lock onto multiple targets. This is required if you want to say like, shoot two missiles at two different opponents at the same time. Then there's also like lock time and missile time. If it wasn't obvious enough, these determine how fast regular weapons and missiles lock on respectively. The lower the value, the faster they'll lock on. Next is the inside part. These are very unique and can you do multiple things, from a floating mine that will home in on your opponent, a napalm rocket specialized in heat damage, and an ECM maker that can make it a nightmare for your opponent to lock onto you, a decoy dispenser that will attract rockets if you're close by, etc, etc, etc. There's a lot of stuff to play around with, so just look at some stuff, see if it looks cool, and then just try it out for yourself. Next up are extensions. Extensions are like inside parts, pretty unique. Things include like a hover booster allowing your AC to hover in place perfectly, anti-missile systems to help you destroy incoming missiles, extra shell and energy max for when your main weapons run out. Again, you need to see what build you're going to make to know what kind of extensions you're going to pick, but these can help round out your build perfectly. Last but most certainly not least, the optional parts. And yes, I know I call the last few parts optional, but these are like actually called optional parts. These things can once again have multiple uses, but the spin here is that you can equip more than one optional part. Every part doesn't weigh anything or add any energy use or anything like that. Rather, every part costs slots, and how many slots you have depends on what core your AC is using. Bigger cores usually have more slots and vice versa, so let's quickly go over some of the optional parts you can equip, like reducing damage from shell and energy weapons, reducing missile lock-on time, increasing the size of your sight lock, increasing laser blade damage, and decreasing energy weapon firing consumptions, a godsend for things like energy builds, improving cooling performances, and so many, many more. These things can turn a good AC into a great one using proper optional parts. Don't let the optional thing fool you, these things can be lifesavers, and it can make your AC so much more fun and free to operate. Now with all those parts out of the way, let's get on to some more fun stuff. The weapons. Armored Core has a lot of different weapons with a lot of different ammo types, firing speeds, etc. etc. So let's just cover some most of the weapon types to see what you're dealing with. Starting with the right arm. Your rifle is your basic workhorse. Good damage, range, firing speed, and ammo. Nothing crazy here, but very functional. Sniper rifles are exactly what you think they are. What they may lack in total ammo and firing speed, they more than make up for in damage, range, and heat damage as well. Good old machine gun. Best used as mid to close ranges, thanks to the spray making most of bullets miss at long range. Good consistent damage, it's also pretty good addition to dishing out decent heat damage. 
Doesn't have a lot of ammo though, so it's not very good for long missions. There's also energy machine guns, which this goes for every single energy weapon about, I'm going to mention with one exception. They don't just use ammo, they also use your energy bar. But to make up for this, they usually do better damage, better regular damage and heat damage. Now, for a personal favorite of mine, the Linear Rifle. The Linear Rifle boasts excellent damage, both in regular shell damage and heat damage, has good ammo, a nice firing of all, good range. It is basically the cross of a sniper rifle and a rocket launcher, and it is just... Mwah, it is such a beautiful gun to use. The handgun, a weapon where most might say its main advantage comes from its incredible light weight. Not having bad stats all around, but not excelling anywhere either. A safe choice, if you will. The bazooka. Now we're talking firepower. Slow firing speed and low ammo, but amazing damage and heat damage. Very situational depending on what mission you're doing, but where you can use it? Oh boy, the enemies won't know what hit them. Spread Bazooka. Depending on which you're getting, these can do multiple things, from just shooting more shells per shot, to exploding into multiple rock rockets right in front of your opponent, making it a nightmare to dodge. Good old shotgun. Exactly what you think it is. Decent ammo, firing speed, but great damage. But only if used up close. I don't think I need to tell you that. There also is a special mag and reload mechanic, where you can only fire a weapon a certain amount of times before you need to go through an extensive reload. But, unlike other weapons, the shotgun reloads while it still has shots in the mag. So if you can play conservatively, you will never have to reload. Definitely a risky weapon and one I personally haven't been able to figure out how to use properly, but it's certainly fun. The Energy Shotgun. More of the same, only it fires energy instead of solid rounds. Firing still takes energy, you get more damage on the good old shotgun and you don't have to worry about the reload. Flamethrower. Now for something a bit more interesting. Close range. No shit. Decent damage output. Weapon with fine ammo capacity. But it has a unique gimmick of doing a ton of heat damage. 
While somewhat hard to use, especially on quick targets, it's basically a free win against an AC that primarily uses energy weapons or boosts around a lot to survive, as their overheats them damn near instantly, so it'll be very hard or even impossible for them to use their equipment at all. Definitely more of a gimmicky weapon, but when the gimmick favors you, oh boy does it favor you. The Grenade Rifle. Intense damage and heat for the cost of taking a long while to properly lock on, low to ammo, and multiple seconds in between shots. But if you do hit the shot, better believe it'll hurt. Hand Missile. Somewhat similar to the bazooka, but being able to lock onto multiple targets, depending on what kind of missile you're getting. The Hand Rocket, the stronger version of the missile in every way except lock-on as this weapon does not get one. You'll have to hit these things manually which can either be easy, in, in which case they are superior in damn near every way, or you're going up against the speedy fucking Gonzales in mecha form, in which case just get something else please. Pulse Rifle, a rifle that shoots energy instead of solid rounds. Basically what has been said for most energy weapons up to this point applies here too. Good damage but requires two sources to keep firing. Laser Rifle. Think Sniper Rifle, but more so based around energy. Now that's most of the regular arm weapons. There's a few more like the high laser rifle or the spurt bazooka where they take one weapon and put a unique spin on them for another weapon of the same type. But I'll leave those for you to discover yourself. If I were to explain all of them we would be here all day. These weapons are, could be equipped to both your left and your right arm. But the left arm also has some weapons that are completely unique to it. So let's get over some of those real quick. Let's start with what's basically the poster boy for this. The Laser Blade. Close range, energy, death incarnate. Doing insane damage at the cost of a little bit of energy depending on what blade you pick. This is also one of, if not the only equipable weapon that uses no ammo, allowing you, allowing you to use it how much you want. Early game this can be used to save a ton of money, because you'll lose money based on how much you, get, you shoot away at the end of a mission and every weapon has an ammo cost except for all energy weapons. And for you from software fans, yes, the Moonlight Sword is a laser blade, and it's always the best in the game. Now for shields. Exactly what you think they are. There's two versions, the regular shield and the energy shield. Regular shields are better for solid rounds, and energy shields are better for energy rounds. You can hold one in front of you while shooting with your other arm weapon, 
The energy has the same down downsides with the energy bar as any other any other energy thing does. Could possibly be useful, but I'm one of those people who thinks that the best defense is unrelenting offense, so I haven't had much time to test these. Let's not waste any more time and head straight into the back weapons. The small missiles, exactly as advertised. A small missile that takes a little while to lock on, but usually has some great homing capabilities. Some of the small missile launchers can fire multiple missiles in quick succession. Micro missiles, weaker version of the small missile with better homing. They also take some more time to fire in between shots. Dual missile. Honestly, what do you think? Fires two small missiles at once. You can have both missiles fire at the same target, or if you aim and position yourself well enough, have both missiles attack two different targets. Multi-missile. When fired, it will usually look like a normal missile until it's right in front of the target, where it will separate into very many different small missiles, making dodging very difficult. You can get some pretty crazy damage output if you're able to make every single small missile hit on a larger target. These things have very low total ammo though, so don't think you can spam it. Cluster missiles. A missile that instead of heading directly towards the target will fly right above them, and then explode dropping many small cluster bombs on them. Very useful against slow but tanky enemies that you don't want to get into direct line of sight of. Small rocket. Yes, a rocket is different from a missile. A, a rocket requires manual aim, but to make up for this, the damage far exceeds that of a missile of the same class. That was also faster firing interval, not having to wait for a lock on or worrying that a fast opponent will break your lock, and these things certainly have their place as a viable alternative. My personal favorite way to use these and other rockets like the mid middle and large rockets is to get in with a laser blade so I can alternate between between insane solid and energy damage when I get in close range. Thanks to you being able to use use and fire both of those weapons simultaneously, it makes for some crazy DPS if you're able to tank some of the damage. The middle rocket. Small mo rocket, but with better damage and slightly less ammo. Usually, al usually also weighs more, but again, the DPS you can get with these might make that worth it. The large rocket. A middle rocket but with better damage and less ammo. Wonder where you heard that one before, huh? It is worth mentioning that while the ammo takes a massive drop, usually having less than even half of the middle rocket's ammo, this gets compensated for with immense damage, usually increasing 
doubling the damage that the middle rocket can do. So yes, while the middle rocket will keep you sustained longer and longer missions and have higher potential damage overall, the pure quick DPS with the large rocket should not be ignored. Chain Gun now before we get into this weapon, I feel it's worth mentioning that this is the point where every back weapon needs to do that crouch thing we talked about before that tank and spider legs don't have to do. When we go back to weapons that don't need that, I'll mention it. The chain gun fires multiple rounds in somewhat quick succession. It's best to be used at close to mid ranges thanks to the bullets scattering everywhere. Slug gun, basically a shoulder shotgun. Thanks to it being a shotgun, the whole crouching makes it damn near useless, so I'd say don't use it with the legs that'll force you to do that. Otherwise, it is pretty good damage, pretty good range. It's basically just a shotgun for your shoulder. The linear gun. A damn near exactly what the linear gun was on the arm weapon slot, just more powerful and slightly slower to compensate. But it is my favorite way to use the linear gun, just purely because of the insane DPS the back weapon provides. The grenade launcher, aka Fuck this dude and everyone around him. Up there are some of the strongest single shot damage of all the weapons. The grenade launcher not only rips through almost anything, but it does it like a hot knife through butter. Metal. Doing immense shell and heat damage, you can never go wrong with one of these strapped on your back. The laser cannon. The laser version of the grenade launcher kinda maybe a little. Do dummy damage, but having decently long time in between shots, it's usually slightly lighter compared to the grenade launcher to compensate for its lower damage. The pulse cannon. Basically rapid fire small orbs of energy. While the DPS can be good, you need to keep in mind that these orbs aren't as fast as the regular solid rounds, so a speedy opponent can easily dodge them. That, and a continuous stream of orbs firing gives very little time for your energy bar to recharge, especially if you're also boosting and flying while you're shooting. So, a very powerful weapon, but also one with a lot of downsides that you need to keep an eye on. The Orbit Cannon. Something a bit more unique, this thing once activated deploys a small orb that automatically fires at any nearby opponents. This orb does not follow you like the Exceed orb, but remains somewhat stationary in midair. This can be useful to set up defensive barriers of, of multiple tiny orbs that can all fire at one opponent and give that opponent multiple targets to fire back at. The back parts also have something like dual weapons. These take up both of your back slots, but often end up being lighter than equipping two different back parts together. Mostly these consist of dual versions of previously thought weapons like the dual missiles, chain guns, grenade launchers, etc, etc. But there's also some more unique back weapons like the big fucking laser 9000, or BTL for short, taking up both slots for technically one cannon, but being absolutely busted in almost every aspect. The only real negative would be its long inter interval between shots and needing to charge another 2 seconds before, fi before firing again. But as long as you can hit your one shot, the enemy will probably go into overheating, making hitting a second shot cake. Ammo isn't really a problem either, considering most things will be dead before you run out of this stuff. Now for something completely unique for back parts, the radars. Basically, if you lack or don't want to equip a certain head that has the stats you want or need, the Raiders can somewhat take its place, being incredibly powerful to the ECM by default, and potentially having things like missile sensors and biosensors, 
it's never a bad idea to have one of these things around. And with that, I do believe we went over every single part and most of the specifics of every weapon. But just knowing everything isn't going to help you build a great AC, especially not your first try. So let's do a small and quick demonstration about how building an AC would go. Okay, I decided as a little bit of a demonstration might be necessary. Just to show you what goes into an AC, how you should be thinking, and things like that. So let's just, I just crammed an AC together. It's called the Azure, Azure Reaper. And forgive me if it, this isn't going to be very scripted. I'm just going off the top of my head right now. But okay. I picked this head because it has decent all-around stats. A A and A versus ECM, which is very nice. B and Energy Drain, which could be better, but not terrible. And has all of the radar functions, all the sensors and whatnot. So it's, it's very nice. The chest, I picked mainly because it's a it's a lightweight that also has an EO, an energy-based EO that shoots very fast. That's my main reason, and a lot of options slots, actually, now that I look at it. And the EO is energy-based, which means that the shots also regenerate, which is very helpful. Arms is just... I mean, these are just very nice arms. Very light, nice health, good energy drain. Not a very nice blade attitude and aim accuracy. Just very nice arms all around. Just pretty damn good for any build. And these legs, they're a bit on the heavier side. And as you see, the moving ability is not good at all. But it has a nice amount of health and carry weight. The, the health actually comes in pretty handy, because Lazar Raven has this thing where if you take too much damage to a certain amount of your uh, armored core, it breaks. And when it has more health, it's harder to break. So that's like also a decision I made with that. She is pretty damn heavy, and it's going to limit my speed. She's my, mobil my mobility on the top right, um, bottom right is actually B instead of A or S. But that doesn't matter as long as I can keep my enemies around mid-range. Because that, that's where this is the most effective. Boosters, I just pick one with good boost power and a good charge drain. Booster heat, I'm not too scared about because of my radiator and all of my other parts. As you'll see, right below there's uh, defense and energy. You'll see that every part also has a little bit of cooling. And these parts have pretty decently good cooling, so I just pick this one. Even if the booster heat is a D, which means it overheats your AC really quickly, the charge drain being S is just very nice. And also the energy drain being a B. It's it's a very nice combo. Uh, just uh, yeah, I didn't really, I don't really think about these things. Yeah, these are the FCSs. Which I should probably actually like look into. Uh, miss a lock time now. Lock, lock time? Yeah. Narrow and deep. I mean, isn't that basically what I have right now? What's this? What's the chart? Lock time on this. Maximum lock mode. Targeting single. I mean, that's not really the. Okay, whatever. Um, okay, generator. High output. With emphasis on energy gauge recovery, because what my build does, and what many would consider the effective strategy in the older games, is just boost really quickly, do a small jump, and then just release boosting, so you still have the momentum from the jump and the boost. That's where something like this comes in very good, in my opinion, because it recharges, the bar recharges really quickly, and that's kind of what I want right now. I'm not flying all about or anything like that. I have one EO, which is energy-based, and that's about it. That's the only thing that's going to really put a hamper on my energy bar. So, condenser gap, emergency cap, and calorific value, I'm not too worried about. It's the energy output that I want. Because, again, the more I have left over, as you can see here, I have a nice, what, 5k? 5k 200? 
left over, which means that my bar recharges really quickly. Then the radiator is just, I just need something with good cooling. Forced cooling is nice, emergency consumption is nice, energy could be better, but it's not, it's not a deal breaker. As you can see at the bottom right again, my cooling is actually A, so it's very nice. I didn't do any inside parts or extensions, no back units, no back, other back units, but okay, here's my first weapon, and it says attack power D, but this is a linear rifle, so it's very powerful for the ammo and this shot interval that you get. Also, it just doesn't cost that much to shoot. You get around 60 bullets, and that's enough, of, not, about enough to blow most ACs away. Then there's a sniper, which that's basically goes into solidify my mid to long range with this build. I'm not really going into the faces. I'm trying to keep them away so I can dodge any like incoming missiles or bullets. I have enough time to react to stuff like that. Again, I don't have any hangar units and optional parts. Okay, these these are always amazing to have. Solid shell ammunition defense and energy con energy ammunition defense. Very nice to have. Improves improve stability when taken fire. That's basically when you get shot. Sometimes you get knocked back a little from like big hits. This stops that, which it does take three slots, but it can be helpful. It's not a deal breaker if you don't have it though, so I'm just going to equip it now and see what's, at, what's up later. Reduce missile lock on time, I don't have missiles. Re increase the sight of sight lock, very useful for my build, because, well, you can also have the VCSs, and they do, like, mess with your targeting a little, a, bit, a little bit. Your weapons also affect that, so, like, if you pick a shotgun right now in my right arm, then my sight lock is going to, like, be a narrow and deep one automatically especially also with the sniper so I'm gonna do that increased sight lock decided to have a little bit more room to play with energy sealed coverage range I'm not using that laser blade not using that increased weapon energy damage I mean my EO is an energy weapon but I don't know if that gets counted here so I'm just gonna equip it and see why not don't need that um, no sure why not Radar range, always very nice. And cooling performance, I do need that. That would be a very handy thing to equip at all ACs. Because again, energy consumption is just not something you're going to be able to help. So it's going to build it up at some point. Just be absolutely sure to, to try and avoid overheating as much as humanly possible. That it's, it's never a bad thing. And I'm not using that either. So... Like, I even got this thing that takes three slots, and I'm still, like, four short. So let's just check the shop. Get your condenser capacity. Sure, I've got the money. I made lock-on cancellation pills. That sounds very neat. Uh, sure. I, I've got money. Okay, so let's go back here real quick. Okay, what's that? Condenser cap. I don't need it actually. Lock on calcination. That that sounds very nice. I haven't tried that yet. And leg part breaking ability, sure. Okay, so that's basically my, my AC right now. Decent defense, decent mobility. Pretty nice mobility, mobility actually. Good cooling. My ECM could do some work and pretty shite energy supply. But that's not that's not a big thing considering I'm not running an energy build. You'll notice energy supply goes way higher the more energy you're building into your mech. And considering I don't do that a lot in this build, it's not too necessary. Same with attack. I'm slowly chipping away at your health from a long distance with this build. I don't need to do crazy high up damage. I don't need to have seven grenade rifles to my shoulders, basically. It's not necessary with this build. It's nice, clean, it's very basic but not bad all around. So let's just take it to the, let's just take it to the training and let's see how it goes. Okay, loading up. I'm not doing any of the, of any of the arena matches because those are meant to be difficult and I don't have an AC built around that. This is gonna be like a basic AC. So as you see, trying to keep my long range advantage here. And you see my opponent's actually, I mean, my, my opponent's an AI, but still, 
you see that they I'm excelling at something and they're trying to take away that advantage of me so I'm gonna damn it I'm gonna try and keep my distance away as humanly possible ah oh, crap didn't dodge that missile and if they do get close I've got this I can pop out do need to be careful because that does take again take my energy bar need to Please forgive me, I haven't played Blast Raven in like two months, so I'm definitely a bit rusty. Oh, fucking block me. Back myself in the corner. You see, even the EO fires when you're not locked on. It's very useful. You do need to be like somewhat in light of sight, but it doesn't need to be in the sight lock box. And also, it's very nice with the... Oh, I win. Oh, yeah, I win. That was easy. See, very nice all around. Not amazing. You're not going to be beating every mission in the game with this. But it's a very nice all around build. It has a good enough uh, ammo so where you can make it through most missions against normal enemies. It's very versatile. You have a lot of mobility with it. I guess the energy bar could do a bit more. I did notice it running like very low the second I started actually building. So maybe fix some stuff with the generator, maybe some energy drain parts, and you can like have something like that much better work out. But for now, this is a pretty good, like decent AC. I scrapped together in like, what, two minutes? Uh, yeah, okay, so that's about that. And with that, I think I've explained most of what AC building is about, or at least what it wants you to know. Now don't go expecting something to make an amazing AC with this knowledge, you're probably going to make a few shit ones before you even make a decent one. Just remember it's all in the experimentation of it. Don't be afraid to try new things, strange combos, maybe you'll find something that works effectively well. It's part of the beauty with this series, just the amount of options you have to customize your AC to perfectly work with your playstyle. Spending hours in the garage fine tuning every little detail until your AC becomes an unstoppable machine of doom. You know literally every single inch of your AC, you know its greatest strength, you know its worst weaknesses, you know exactly how long it took for your AC to get here, and it's something that you made entirely on your own, and that is why AC building is just so much fun. Oh god, I just realized. I just realized I didn't really record an outro, I didn't even write one down in the script. It's fucking like 5am right now, I'm tired. <laughs> I just got done editing for like 10 hours to grind to try and like crank this out, but uh, alright, let's just get this out of the way, I just wanna, holy shit, thank you for sitting through this, what, give me, give me a second, I'm gonna open Premiere, but hour long, it's a fucking hour long, what the hell did I do with my life, hour long ass tutorial on how to build a fucking video game robot, honestly, what are you doing with your life, I wanna give special thanks to Star, for being an absolute twat and not helping me at all in the production of this video. I also want to th um, uh, thank Math for not giving me permission to make that joke in the beginning. If you have a problem with it, don't send me 17 paragraphs on why Malini is a bad boss next time. Okay, that's it, I think. I Yeah. Just th Okay, just seriously for a second. Holy shit, thank you for watching all of this. As you clearly t probably can clearly tell, this entire video was a very massive undertaking for me. Someone who sucks at editing and voice recording, as you've probably noticed. Uh, scripting, so if if it's at all possible, if, it, if it's not too much of a hassle, please, please just p press that like button. I would appreciate it. It gives me a, f a funny little tingling feeling down under. I would really appreciate it. Maybe even the sub button if you want to make it extra special for me. But okay, I'm just going to drop things down. I'm going to go, I'm going to put this fucking stupid ass voice clip in premiere and i'm gonna go to bed now all right just thanks for thanks for watching man see you take care